Welcome to the Smart Business Revolution. 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 Do you want a revolution? Yeah. You say you want a revolution. Revolution. The revolution. It's going on right now. Welcome to The Revolution, the Smart Business Revolution podcast, where we ask today's most successful entrepreneurs to share the tools and strategies they use to build relationships and connections to grow their revenue. Now, now, your host for The Revolution, John Corcoran. All right, welcome everyone. John Corcoran here. You know me, I'm the host of the show, and you know my story. I'm a recovering political hack. I'm a recovering lawyer. I spent years working in politics, including as a speechwriter with stints in the Clinton White House and for a California governor, and also practicing law. And you know, 10 years ago, I discovered this medium of podcasting. And you know what I get to do every week? I get to talk to smart people, smart CEOs, smart founders and entrepreneurs of all kinds of companies and organizations ranging from YPO to EO, Activation Blizzard, Lending Tree, Open Table, and many more. My guest today is no exception. You are really going to enjoy this conversation. I'm also the co founder of Rise25, where we help B2B businesses with the strategy and production they need, create a podcast and content marketing that produces tremendous ROI, connects them with their ideal prospects and referral partners. And so, my guest today, his name is Sean Joe Hall. He is an entrepreneur, business growth coach, workshop leader, speaker, father, and husband, co founded Dolls Lighting in 2009, and he built it up from scratch to over 40 employees. From there, he led the implementation of structured growth and 3 x the company's revenue. He says the highlight, though, was not the revenue, but the world-class company culture that they built in the process. So we're going to talk about that. He's also been a finalist for the EY Entrepreneur of the Year Award and former president of Entrepreneurs Organization, EO, Montreal chapter, an organization that I participate in and love great organization, recommended to everyone. It's also been featured in a bunch of different media public publications, too many to mention. And he's also a business growth coach and certified scaling up expert. So we're going to get into all of that. But first, before we get into that, this episode is brought to you by Rise25, which helps B2B businesses to get clients, referrals, and strategic partnerships with Done For You podcasts and content marketing. If you are listening to this podcast and you've ever thought about doing a podcast, I say absolutely do it. One of the best things I've ever done in my life and will connect you to your ideal strategic partners, referral partners, clients, you name it. Go to rise25media.com and you can learn more. All right, Sean, I'm so excited to talk to you. This episode, this uh, interview has been quite some time in the making. And I want to start w for you with 2008, 2009. Now you are have moved into this family business that was started by your in-laws. Your brother-in-law is also involved in it. And boom, financial crisis hits. And this company, which is like a, I think over a $50 million company, kind of comes crashing down. Bring us back to that time period, what was happening and how you got found, navigated your way through it. Absolutely, John. Well, thanks for having me, by the way. Really excited to, to be here today. So yeah, I joined the uh, family business. I was coming out of the corporate world, you know, worked for Rubbermaid, uh, which is a great company, you know, $7 billion company. A lot of great things happening out of that business. I learned a lot of great leadership hacks and tools there. So many great leaders in that uh, entrepreneur uh, in that organization. And I joined this family business, you know, as a sales manager, and it was on a really fast growth path. It was a public company. Somehow, some way, my father-in-law took a bankrupt company and brought on the TSX stock exchange and went public. No one knows today how the heck he pulled it off. It was really impressive. Uh, and so, you know, he did this crazy move. It was just buying companies, not much organic growth, really purely based on mergers and acquisitions. And he was able to take the business to over 50 million in revenue in about seven years. So a really great success story along the way. But like many success stories that, you know, some of them do have unhappy endings, unfortunately. And what happened was when the financial crisis hit, he had also purchased a very a large organization that probably wasn't a great synergy fit for the overall group. And within a year, the whole thing came crashing down. It was a very dramatic, very difficult for the family. I remember that year of 2008 was just, you know, horrible. We were just spending time around the table trying to see what money we can get to pay suppliers with. Um, but, you know, with every tough story can come an opportunity. And so when that happened, my brother-in-law and I, uh, Joey, we had a chance to buy back three of the divisions and start from scratch. And so, you know, we bought back three of the uh, divisions. We wanted to save those employees jobs. And so we brought them all back into one place. And that's where we founded Dallas Lighting, shipped our first order in June 29, uh, 2009, actually. Wow, that's a dark time right then. Now, I, I know you're a big fan of culture and the impact that it can have on a business. 
So um, looking back at the way the business had been structured before the financial crisis and, and meltdown, is there anything that you would have done differently? Uh, or is there anything, the you know, only big warning signs that you, you saw in retrospect that made you realize that there were cultural issues that were, that were going to cause, uh, you know, in addition to the financial crisis, cause a major meltdown? Yeah, there was a, a lot of elements, John, that we saw in there. First of all, I'd say to you, accountability. We absolutely did not have a culture of accountability. Uh, the big problem was that you have all these independent companies doing incredibly well, but then you're building this head office that's there to support all these companies. And what are you doing is that you're taking the profit from these really great companies and you're spending it on a head office and you're putting new sales managers and a new marketing team and a new accounting team. But what are they really giving back to those companies? What are they bringing to the table? Not a lot, to be honest with you, back in the day. So it was almost like this idea where we thought, you know what, we're going to build this big head office that's going to bring all these, these great tools to these companies. But those companies were fine on their own and they didn't really need that. So there was this real lack of accountability of who is in charge of what that ended up being like a really, really big issue. But I'd say to you, that was probably number one. And number two, which is something we learned along the way to be very careful with, is that financially speaking, we weren't sound, right? Even though you're in a company that's in this fast growth. And a lot of companies that are public and fast growth don't really care that much about bottom line. They're caring more about really just case scaling revenue, churning you know, a bunch of money out, losing a bunch of money every month. We weren't really in that position. We weren't one of those crazy hyper growth companies. We still needed to be profitable. And unfortunately, we weren't looking at bottom line quite enough. Um, you know, We kept thinking, oh, this inventory is really great. We're going to be able to sell it here. And this client's fine. It's no big deal that you know, we're losing money with them. You know, The financial side wasn't looked at quite enough. So I would say those two big elements were greatly lacking in that uh, previous business. Mm. And so it sounds like the, the acquisitions were kind of funding the growth. It wasn't, some of these divisions were not profitable. Yeah, they, it was really a matter of the fact that they, we were going out getting money from the public, buying these companies that were doing pretty well on their own, but then we we're taking all that money and reinvesting it into this head office. But the head office really wasn't just bringing enough back towards these companies. So it was mm. kind of a weird dynamic, you know, where, what would have been better looking back is that, you know, you keep this head office really small and tight, you know, maybe just keep three or four people in there running things. And then you're having these companies, you know, be profitable on their own. That really was the opposite of what we were doing, to be honest with you. Right, right. Now, um, a couple of years, so you, you start the new business, you found this new business. And, and now um, looking back, you've said in other interviews that you realize now that that was a really risky thing that you did. So tell us exactly what the plan was, you and your brother-in-law. So, you know, I look back at a lot of people say, oh, you know, you're an entrepreneur and you did all these crazy things or you're an entrepreneur, you must have thought through the strategies of logic and business. And I'm looking back a lot of times, I think, you know what? No, we were just naive. Like we didn't really know what the heck we were doing. <laughs> we ended up taking out these second mortgages on our home and we were actually gonna take all that money and put it back into the old business. And it's oh. crazy because I remember my father-in-law calling us at 9.30 at night and the signing was happening at 10 p.m. that night. And he wow. said to us, guys, we cannot put the money back into the old business. Like, I'm sure it's just going to get sucked into the this, vortex. Your father-in-law so, said this? You know, he, he did. He wow, did. to his and credit, it because it, I mean, sure it would have helped to shore up the business. Wow. No, to his credit, not only did he do that, but he really helped us after that, you know, uh, facilitate conversations with the bank, and, you know, with all the different people involved in this crazy bankruptcy to help us pull out these divisions and, you know, kind of buy them back at a reasonable price. So he was really instrumental in all of it, despite, you know, the terrible situation that we we're living through. And so, you know, I was ready to be honest with you, John, like, had he not called, I was putting this money. I had a wow. pregnant wife, you know, she, she had, we had our first uh, child was born. Our second child was on the way. Um, you know, it was like a crazy time, but I was just ready to just throw and trust my father-in-law and say, you know what, if you think this is the best way, place to put my money, I'll put it in the business. And then when he called back and said, don't do that, you know, it was a godsend to be honest so, with you. So then what did you do? So instead you decided to buy some of the divisions and start an, a, a new company with your brother-in-law. Yeah. Exactly. We had about 10 different ideas at that point. We were going to do a few different things. I was actually, I was going to start, I thought about opening a gym at one point. Then I was going to become a sales agent. Like I had all these ideas. I didn't know what I was supposed to do. But then when we had this opportunity to buy back these divisions, they were a mess, John. I mean, I'm talking, no one else could have come in and bought these things because they were such a mess at that point. It, we were doing okay. what so, we so, what was so first question, happening there. So question A is, why, why, back. we knew the employees as well. So question is, like, why, why those divisions? Like if they were a mess, what did you see? What potential did you see in them? 
Well, again, a bit of naivety. I mean, we just looked at it and said, well, if someone could fix this, it's us, because we kind of know the ins and outs of this business. And the other big thing was that we had a great partner at Home Depot, uh, which is a wonderful partner. And for some reason, we still don't quite know today, they said, you know what, we're going to give you a second chance. We're going to let you start all over again, and we're going to give you back a contract. And we had spent a year doing horrible shipping to them, like terrible. If I was the buyer, I would never have given us a second chance. <laughs> so I don't know what happened there. She was really sweet. She really liked us. She said, okay, you know what? I speak my VP. I'm going to give you guys a second chance. She gave us that opportunity. We knew that business really well. I had learned it myself when I was working at Rubbermaid. I'd been part of the Home Depot division. So I really understood the ins and outs of Home Depot. My partner knew them well also. And so that was really the catapult because we were kind of taking off with this $3 million contract right off the bat. So it really helped us you know, take things and start the business the right way. Um, so yeah, at that point, it was just, we have these employees who want to save their jobs. We have a product line that we understand, and we have our biggest customer who's willing to start again. So taking those, you know, that triangle, that trifecta of information, that's what made it, you know, kind of a no-brainer. I'm saying a no-brainer, but it was yeah. wasn't going to be the right decision at first. But we we went that way, and we we made the right decision in the end. Did you work on culture from the beginning, or is that something that you realized later was important? We absolutely did not work on culture whatsoever. <laughs> <laughs> you know, the first couple of years, we couldn't even get any type of financing or anything that we were doing. We couldn't even get a bank to support us. So for us, it was really challenging because the bank said, you know what, you guys are not viable. Uh, we don't want to give you any money. And I said, okay, so what are you supposed to do? We got into this crazy thing called factoring. I don't know if you've ever heard of factoring. Uh, factoring is nasty, okay? Factoring okay. is basically what you're doing is you're getting like a company to fund your receivables and your inventory at a very high dollar amount, a very high percentage amount. You're paying tons of dollars towards, and as you make more money, as you make more sales, they give you more money, but then they take more control of your inventory and receivables right. at a high. I think that interest rate right. continues to be at eight, nine, ten percent, right. uh, which is really, really high. But for us, it actually helped us because we did that for a couple of years, and then that transitioned us into a bank. We cared nothing whatsoever about culture. We were just trying to survive, like most small businesses. And even though I noticed that with a lot of businesses that I go working with, it's the same idea. They're just trying to make another dollar, you know, at that next day. But what happened to us was that in 2013, uh, we hit a wall in our business. You know, we had, I'll give you an idea of how bad the culture was. We had two customer service people sitting between the main phone and my partner and I could see them and the phone would ring, but neither one of them wanted to be known as a receptionist. So a customer would call and the phone would ring and it would ring and it would ring. It would ring about 10 times, but they would just, neither one would look at it. And eventually, one of them would grab it out of pure frustration. And I was like, at that point, I realized, oh, my God, guys, we have a really, really bad company culture. No one really cares about what we're trying to do here. You know, they're just worried about themselves. And at that time, what happened was our biggest competitor at that exact moment came out with a product line. They copied every single one of our products, so 200 products, every single one of them, and put them at a dollar less on the market. Wow. Wow. They used the same suppliers as us as well. So we were super disappointed with our suppliers who kind of went to them and said, yes, we'll sell to you all the same products. Mm. And, you know, it was so at the time, the absolute worst thing that could happen to us. And today, the absolute best thing that ever happened to us. So what that did that, time, we, yeah, what did it, it force like, you no, to I, do? It, it, would, it forced us a couple of things. First of all, we have to look in the mirror, right? And say, you know what? This is not, we are not running this business properly at all, for sure. We're going to get back into the terrible situation we got into in 2008. And the second thing we did is we had just read, uh, read the Rockefeller Habits, Vern Harnish's first book. And we met, luckily, a coach at that point who had just started her career. Uh, and we said, you know what? We met her through EO. And we said, we should maybe give this person a chance. And she didn't have much experience. So we thought, you know what? Maybe we should be bringing in a coach from Toronto who's been doing this for a while. But our company is super French because we're in Montreal. We're in this very French located territory. And our people at that time, a lot of them didn't speak English. I said, okay, we're going to bring in this guy from Toronto and half our team can't even understand what he's saying. And she was speaking, you know, perfect French. And so we ended up hiring her instead. And uh, we've been doing it ever since. I mean, we never looked back after that. Wow. And you said that you changed 80% of your team over five years as a result of some of those changes that you made. How did you hire differently once you started making those changes? And so that's what one of the things that we were forced to do, right? You have to look, really look carefully at your team when you're doing this process and you have to really decide, okay, are these the right people for our organization? And then you start getting into that category of people. You know, there's two categories that, that are kind of below the line, which are not good, right? There's a category of a person who's 
right? I'm not very good on the values, I'm not very good on productivity. That person you should probably just be firing because if they're not productive and they're not values based, but then you have the really tough people. Those are the people that are super productive, but they're not nice. They don't believe in your values. They don't believe in teamwork. We call them brilliant jerks, right? That's kind of that category of people. And we protect those people because they're so productive. You say, I cannot live without this productive person. And so you protect them, you protect them, but eventually they're such a cancer in the organization that they, you know, turn things uh, into the wrong, you know, type of organization that you're really looking to build. It was over time. It was really tough at first to let go of people who didn't fit the culture. But as we started doing it, it really becomes easy at one point because then you're changing those people with A players, people who really care about values are really productive, really have the company's culture at heart. And those people don't accept, you know, the people who don't care about company culture. And so the people who don't accept it anymore don't fit. So they start feeling alienated and they feel like they don't fit in the organization. A bunch of them left on their own, which was really great for us. And then a bunch we had to let go because they didn't fit. And I can tell you today, it took us about five years to do it. But today is the first time in our organization over the last maybe 18 months where we no longer have one person that's kind of below that, that value productivity axe. Mm. How did you go about deciding on what your core values were? We, we really built them from scratch. At the time when we had done it, it was my partner and I. Um, it was right at the same time as the Rockefeller House, but maybe just a year before. We had actually received, uh, we were both part of the board of uh, EO at that, at that time, and EO did strategic planning, right, per chapter. And we just stole the tools that we were given by EO to do strategic planning, and we had built our EO values for our Montreal chapter, and we just did the same process where him and I just sat in our room all day and said, you know, what do we want our company to be all about? And we really took the time to nail down all the values that we wanted, and shockingly to me, we haven't changed one of them in the last seven years. We've actually kept the exact core values we came up with that day. We played with them a little and you know, did a few little modifications to them. But overall, we decided to keep them because they worked so well for us. And they're still the hallmark uh, of the business today. Wow. Um, and uh, you know, you, it's also a family-owned business. It's you and your brother-in-law. You say you have, a, have, have had a great relationship with him over the years. Um, but also your, your in-laws were in the business. Your wife was in the business for a while. So what are your, some of your secrets for having a, a, a family business run uh, function without uh, devolving into uh, bitterness and uh, acrimony? I think it's a, a lot of meditation. I think that's uh, number one. You got to do learn patience. <laughs> Um, you know, it was funny because, you know, the in-laws, they had been part of the other business. And when they came in with the new business, they started helping us, but it wasn't the full-time involvement. They were kind of handling sales for us in the U.S. So we weren't really spending direct time with them. And then my wife was in the business. We had young kids. So that didn't last very long because it was so strenuous for her. We were living kind of far from the business too. It was like an hour away. And so she had to travel every single day, which didn't make a lot of sense. And then on the weekends, all we'd be talking about is business all day and all night. So at one point, we made the decision that she needed to step away from the business. Uh, my in-laws who were working from a distance weren't involved too much strategically, so that part worked really well. Um, it was okay because they didn't need to be involved in the big decisions. And so it really came down to my brother-in-law and I who have a really great relationship, and we were able to really take the right type of decisions together. Uh, you know, like most business partners, you know, there's always a, a few arguments and a few disagreements here and there, but for the most part, uh, we were really able to keep you know, that relationship intact by being respectful, really understanding each other's strengths and weaknesses, playing off of them as much as possible and, you know, making sure we gave each other space. Yeah. I, I love asking this question for those who are involved in EO, which you have been for many years. What role has that played being a part of a forum, part of that community? Um, I, I think probably most of my listeners know what a forum is, particularly in the EO context, but what role did that play over this, the last 10 years or so? I would say to you that my form is the single reason that we are able to, you know, 3X our business. Um, the learning I got from my, my form, my form is a very high growth form. So a lot of members have high growth companies, uh, fast growing, you know, opportunities happening there. So I think that really helped the fact that all of us were growing at the same pace together. So we were learning off of each other's challenges and opportunities, sharing the ton of resources along the way. We're very like-minded individuals. Um, so for me, it's been absolutely, you know, essential in our business growth. Everybody in my form is really obsessed with personal development as well. So we spent a lot of time developing ourselves personally and uh, looking at opportunities together to take that to the next level too. So it's been, um, for me, EO has been just unbelievable. The friendships, the relationships, the learning, the people I got to meet, you know, I met my mentor, Warren Rustan through EO, uh, Vern Harnish, I met through EO, and now I'm part of Scaling Up Organization. 
uh, a lot to do with that relationship as well. So for me, it's, you know, the single greatest tool any entrepreneur could have. Mm. Um, now, about two years ago, you decided to take a step back from Dolls Lighting and to go more full bore into coaching. What inspired that? So there's a few different reasons. The first thing was that we've been being coached, obviously, by Clio. It was amazing for a couple of years. I really love the methodology. For me, it was something really amazing and inspiring. It had such a big impact on our business. And I was using that with Accelerator companies. So Accelerator being a program of EO, I was teaching you know, for about a couple of years, a bunch of entrepreneurs through that methodology. Um, so for me, I really understood it. I saw it work not only in my business, a bunch of entrepreneurs I knew were doing it as well. So I knew that the methodology was amazing and any big company that would put it in place had success. And then there was you know, an aspect where I was finding it really stressful, the day-to-day -day of the business. I also had my brother-in-law had a really great vision. It was tough for us to both have our visions in the business. And I said, you know what? Maybe I'll just support your vision and that would be even better for our growth. And you know, I'll be the coach of the business. I'll help out as much as possible, but you really run with this. We'll bring in a couple of VPs to replace what I'm doing. And I'll go out there and I'll go help a lot of other entrepreneurs do what they're trying to do, you know, help them scale. I like to call it profitable growth. That's kind of how I refer to it more than, you know, hyper growth. Uh, I like to make sure my clients are profitable along the way. And so it just made a lot of sense. And there was also this other really strange thing happening again with a language barrier thing. There was actually no English speaking coach in Montreal at that time. And there was a hole for that. And so Cleo actually said, you know, we're missing a coach. You should really, you know, become a coach and help out. I was already giving some leadership conferences along the way. I thought, you know, those go perfectly together. And so that's what led to my journey. Although, ironically, about 80% of my clients are French. So that's, uh, I don't know what happened there, but it's just and, the way it goes sometimes. It's an interesting lesson in, in marketing your business in, in different communities, because I heard another interview with you where you talked about the differences between marketing your coaching business now, which is different from the lighting business. Um, you know, inside of Montreal, where a lot of people speak French or, or, you know, don't speak any English at all. And also marketing your business in other parts of Canada and marketing your business in the US. So talk a little bit about the differences and what you've learned from that experience. It's really night and day. I mean, it's completely different. I mean, we really went from a manufacturing kind of consumer goods to me trying to market like a service and, you know, something that's really based on my personal experience of having done it in my own business. So a lot of my marketing goes around my story. Like I, and I know people talk about how important a story is, for me, that couldn't be more true. It's just unbelievably important because I can tell people, listen, yes, I'm a scaling up coach, but I'm an entrepreneur first. And I've done this in my own business. And you know what? And Vern, I hope Vern closed his ears to this, but you know, there are parts that work amazing, but there are parts that maybe are, you know, need a little bit of extra attention. But as an entrepreneur, I've actually done those things in my business. I've implemented some of my own tools. And so here's the success I've had. And so, you know, I feel in a position where I can come in and help you. And I always explain to my clients, I say, I, I don't really like to see myself as a consultant or someone just coming in and not even that much as a coach. I usually call myself kind of a business partner. You know, I kind of come in as a business partner. Your success is my success. If you do not do well with this, like it's a total failure on my behalf as well. And I also tell them that, you know what, as an entrepreneur, I'm probably going to be bringing a lot of ideas to the table and I may challenge you in a different way than a coach who hasn't run a business might do. I said, you need to be prepared and comfortable with that. But normally entrepreneurs really like that pitch and really understand how it makes sense for them. So That's great. You've got a book coming out. It's called The Happy Leader. It's been in the works for a couple of years now. Tell me what uh, inspired you to put your effort into a book. Absolutely. So crazy enough, the book's been uh, started eight years ago uh, when I just was at home and I was like, every night, you know, my wife would fall asleep a little earlier than I and say, you know what, let me just go write a few paragraphs on my ideas and then it turned into this concept of a book and the where it really came from to be honest with you is eo because what i noticed is that entrepreneurs for the most part i know this might sound really funny for the audience but they're not happy like it's you know we meet in our forum and we do a one word open at first and a lot of the words are i'm overwhelmed i'm stressed i'm not happy with where things are going i have no balance and i started realizing that people kept waiting for this you know moment in the future where they were going to find happiness and my mentor kept telling me that he's like, listen, you cannot wait for some moment in the future. You need to be happy and enjoy the journey along the way. And so I built this book where it's a story about a person who's kind of living through a struggle in their business life. Uh, and they really, you know, they're, they suck at home. They're terrible to their family. And they meet someone who really puts them on the right path to happiness and success and helps them, you know, figure out a better way of living. So that's really, you know, the concept behind the book. Very cool. All right. I want, we're running out of time. So I want to wrap up two more questions. So first, 
you know, I'm a big fan of gratitude. And when you look at others who you have walked this path with, maybe other peers of yours or uh, others in your forum or other EOers or anything like that, others in your industry, perhaps, who do you admire? Who do you respect? Who comes to mind when you think of that? Wow, there's there's so many. I mean, it's really unbelievable. For sure, my my mentor Warren Russ. I have to bring him up. Um, you know, he's such an incredible guiding light. Uh, he's coming out with his own book actually right now, which is gonna be really amazing. Talking about a lot about leadership and the leader within us. Um, Warren has been someone who's taught me so much about the power of giving back, uh, servant leadership. Right? I never really understood that concept for quite some time until he brought it up to me and said, "You know what? You're at that stage now, Sean. You need to flip the script." And you need to stop looking to others for leadership and you need to be giving it back now. You need to start mentoring people. You need to go out there, help businesses as much as possible. And so I'm, you know, very, very grateful for everything uh, he has, has brought to me. I mean, it's been just such an incredible learning. Uh, Vern Arnish is another guy who, you know, I've spent a lot of time with in the last couple of years. He's really, you know, helped me understand, you know, not just how to scale a business and what comes with that, but also how to lead other leaders. You know, he speaks a lot about that how to take your leadership and lead other leaders in their organizations, really provide them with you know, the right tools and resources so they can take their business to the next level. Uh, so very grateful to, to him as well. Uh, you know, another last person I'll mention that comes to mind a lot is a guy named Connor Neal, who a lot of people know through EO. Uh, he's an EO Barcelona member, and he actually teaches people how to do public speaking. And that public speaking for me has been just an unbelievable tool that I've utilized in a lot of different ways. And he taught me that about five years ago at the Global Leadership Academy how to give a speech, whether it's a three-minute speech or a three-hour speech, how to give a workshop, how to have the right type of voice, tonality, you know, body language. Um, so I'm incredibly grateful to him too. I could go on. I mean, the list is unlimited in terms of my four members as well, obviously, that have helped me along the way, but it's, uh, been, it's been an amazing ride. Great list. So, all right, final question now. This is looking a little bit further back in your journey. So let's pretend that we're at an awards banquet, much like the Oscars or the Emmys. You're receiving a Lifetime Achievement Award for everything you've done up until this point. What we all want to know is, who do you thank? So not just, you know, I, I guess Warren probably would, would be included on that list. Vern would be included on that list. But is there anywhere else going further back, friends, mentors, peers, business partners, you know, a teacher when you were a child, you would acknowledge in your remarks? Yeah, for sure. I, I really thank my business partner, Joy, my brother-in-law, you know, always supported everything that I was doing along the way. Uh, that's been really you know, amazing for me. Uh, so really grateful to him. Another person, which is really huge for me, is my, uh, I won a national soccer championship and I had a coach at that point. And his name was Dean Giuliano. And he taught me the power of visualization. Uh, you know, we had a team that wasn't that strong and we won a national championship. I would say almost based purely on his visualization techniques and his, him teaching us how to have belief in ourselves. Uh, so that's someone else who, for me, I look back and think, oh my gosh, you know, that was someone who just taught me almost everything I know today about visualization. Um, so that was, you know, a really, really big deal for me as well. Um, so those are probably the two people that really come to mind when I look back and think like, okay, you know, who took me to my furthest level and gave me the most opportunity? I would say those two people. Very cool. All right. The book is The Happy Leader. Elevationcoach.ca is the website. Is there anywhere else people can go to learn more about you, Sean, or to connect with you? Absolutely. Actually, just launching a new website just now, which is called uh, seanjohal.com. Uh, so finally went back to my namesake. I reserved that name a couple of years ago, but never used it. Uh, I'm very active on LinkedIn as well. So if you go to Sean Joel on LinkedIn, you see I, I post pretty much daily. I have a, a lot of things I like to share there with the audience. So those would be the two best places. Excellent. All right, Sean. Thanks so much. Thank you, John. Really appreciate it. Thank you for listening to the Smart Business Revolution podcast with John Corcoran. Find out more at smartbusinessrevolution.com. And while you're there, sign up for our email list and join the revolution. 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 And be listening for the next episode of the Smart Business Revolution podcast.